Welcome, welcome every single one of you to this month's Marriage God's Way virtual seminar. I request you, wherever it is that you are in this part of the world, I just request if you can just take this opportunity and just pray for yourself. Pray for yourself, pray for yourself and present yourself to God anew. I do not know where you're at with God, but I do know that you believe in God, which is why you're here, because we are here to do marriage God's way. So why don't you just take this opportunity to just pray to God, pray to God, wherever it is that you're at. Are you feeling down? Are you feeling blessed? Are you feeling fulfilled? Are you feeling lost? Are you feeling confused? Are you feeling heavy burdened? Are you feeling light and enthusiastic? Regardless of where you're at in your life, just take this opportunity to just present yourself to the Lord, your God, your maker the one who created you, the one in whom you move and you exist, the one who has blessed you for the years that you have lived. Just take this opportunity and thank the God who has given you life, who has given you health, who has given you intellect, who has given you literacy, who has given you wisdom, who has given you his word, who has given you salvation. Oh Lord, indeed, we thank you. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you, we thank you, O oh Lord. We shall start today's seminar with thanksgiving. Thanking you, Father, for the gift of life. Thanking you, Father, for the gift of marriage. Thanking you, Father, for the gift of salvation, the gift of children, the gift of friends, the gift of internet, the gift, Lord Jesus Christ, of your word. Lord, you have blessed us immensely and we thank you. We thank you and we exalt your holy name, O oh Lord. We enthrone you in this place. Holy Spirit, have your way, have your way in this place. Your word says, O oh Lord, that where two or three are gathered in your name, there you are in their midst. And we are convict, convinced, we are convicted that indeed you are here, O oh Lord. You are here, O oh Lord, to minister to us. And here we are presenting ourselves in our various seasons in life, O oh Lord. We present, our, we present ourselves before you, O oh Lord. You know where every single individual who's here is at in his life or her life, O oh Lord. You know the ones, Lord Jesus Christ, who feel lost. You know the ones who feel grateful. You know the ones, Lord Jesus Christ, who feel heavy. You know the ones, Lord Jesus Christ, who are in need of wisdom, direction, healing, who are in need of a word from you, O oh Lord. Speak your word in season, O oh Lord. And even as you tackle matters concerning love, matters concerning marriage, matters concerning romance, matters concerning family, Lord, we ask you that you may have your way during these three days. Starting today, day one of this Marriage God's Way virtual seminar, the month of May, we ask you, O oh Lord, to have your way, to guide us, to walk with us, to refresh us, Holy Spirit, teach us new things and remind us what you've already taught us. We submit ourselves before you. In Jesus' name, we have prayed, trusting and believing. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Welcome every single individual, wherever it is that you're tuning in from, Kenya, USA, UK, Australia, Ghana, Malawi, wherever it is that you're at, we are celebrating you. We love you and we thank God for you. Uh, our host, Gift Zawadi Love, is actually not feeling uh, at her best right now. Her voice is not feeling her best. So she will not be on video uh, for today's uh, session, but she's here with us. So I'm just going to share the screen and then we get to start. My name is Dan Masinde. I shall be your speaker today and as we tackle this important topic. So in case today's your first time, Marriage God's Way Virtual Seminar, we do this every single uh, month, first, second, and third. So today being day one, today being May 1st, our topic for today is building and rebuilding trust. How to make the bond stronger and restore what's broken. So how do you build trust in your relationship? How do you rebuild trust in case it's been broken? It's why we are here today. It's why we're here to get to explore and to learn from God. Remember, we are doing marriage God's way. I know some of us here are single, others are married, others are perhaps you, you're wondering where it is that you're at. Some of us are dating. And so we are here to learn and we hope that every single lesson is going to be valuable to you. So let's just get straight to it. So what is trust? What is trust? What is trust? And even as we go on, if you have any questions, please, as we, as we go along, please feel free to write in your questions. Then we shall tackle them towards the very, very end of the talk. So what is trust? 
Trust is reliability of someone, relying on, on someone, reliability uh, of someone. So the more someone gets close to you, you're going to interact with different people in life. You're going to have friends, you're going to have colleagues, but the more an individual gets close to you, the bigger the level of trust, the higher the level of trust, which is why we expect so much from our spouse. We expect them to be reliable. We expect them to be trustworthy. We expect them to be dependable. So we're looking at the level of trust in a relationship, in a romantic relationship, in marriage. We expect it to be a higher level of trust. Song of Solomon chapter two, verse six to eight reads, his left hand is under my head and his right hand caresses me. Promise me, women of Jerusalem, swear by the swift deer and the gazelles that you will not interrupt our love. I hear my lover's voice. He comes running over the mountains, racing across the hills to me. Look at the way this individual is so dependent on the lover, relying on the lover and saying, please don't mess what we have. We are trying to build something. There's a higher level of trust in this romantic union. And praise be to God that he even cares about our romantic life and for verses such as this one. So there are two types of trust. There are two types of trust when you're talking about the marriage context. There are two types of trust. There is conditional trust. Conditional trust. Conditional trust is pegged on effort. It's pegged on effort. It is all about you being a good steward. It is how you behave. It is built by how you carry yourself. So this is conditional trust. This conditional trust are things that you do that make somebody feel safe with you. Feeling safe with you. I don't have to watch my back because of you. You've got me. You've got me. Wherever it is that you go, wherever it is that I am, you've got me. Whether we are close to each other, I don't have to worry about my back. I trust you. Now, that is conditional trust. You've made me feel safe. You've put in effort to make me feel safe. Conditional trust also that means that your intentions are good. Your intentions are good. I can see you and I can see that your motive is right. I can see that the way you're treating me, I can see where you're coming from. I can see your intentions. Your motives towards me are good. I can also see that you consider me in your choices. Before you make a decision, you're considering me. Therefore, I trust you. That is conditional. I am trusting you because of what you're doing. I am trusting you because of how you're behaving. I am trusting you because of what you're saying, because of what you're doing. You are partially responsible with my heart, partially responsible with my heart, my emotions, and my well-being to the extent that you can. There is a very deliberate reason why we're using the word partially. Partially because you, I, we are supposed to be fully responsible for our heart, our emotions, and our well-being. But our spouse is partially responsible with our heart, our emotions, our well-being. They are not the, the common uh, denominator as to our emotions, our heart, and our well-being. That is our personal responsibility, but they have a, an influence, a role to play when it comes to how they handle our emotions, how they handle our heart. And also conditional trust means I can depend on your words and commitment. When you tell me something, I can bank on it. When you tell me you're going to do something, I can bank on that. When you tell me, hey, I'm committing to you, it is me, you and I, we're doing this, I can bank on that. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37 says, simply let your yes be yes and your no to be no. Anything more comes from the evil one. The Bible is encouraging us to be people of our word, people who are dependable. What we say can be trusted. What we say, our commitment can be trusted. When you say it, I do to me, I can bank on that. When I say it, I do to you, you can bank on that. Now that is conditional trust. It is pegged on effort. It is pegged on what somebody does, what somebody says. Now the second form of trust when it comes to marriage, the second form of trust is unconditional trust. The first one was conditional. The second one is unconditional. Unconditional. Why is it unconditional? Because this one is not pegged on effort. It's pegged on grace. It is pegged on grace. It is full trust in God. It is all about God. It is not about you. It is not about me. It is unconditional trust in God. It is trusting fully in God, not in self or not in you, not in self or another. Because Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 5, and it reads, this is what the Lord says, 
Cursed is the one who trusts in a man, who draws strength from mere flesh, and whose heart turns away from the Lord. So we are being reminded that in as much as you're seeking to trust your spouse, above all else, trust God unconditionally. Trust God unconditionally. Unconditional trust also means that this is the kind of trust that keeps me from being self-confident that I cannot hurt you. We need to realize that there are many people, especially believers, who have fallen because they were overconfident. You are perhaps this individual who's saying, ah, I can never, I can never cheat on my spouse. Me, I can never do that. You hear stories about people doing, perhaps behaving badly. You're the one who's telling yourself, ah, I can never speak like that to my spouse. I can never do that. That is you deriving confidence in yourself instead of it is God who's keeping me. I trust in the Lord to keep me. I trust in the Lord to keep you. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse uh, 7 to 10, and it reads, Therefore, in order to keep me, this is Paul writing, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, conceited, self-confident, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of, of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is us being reminded, do not depend on your strength. Do not depend on you. Depend on God. Unconditional trust. Even with your spouse, do not depend fully on your spouse. Depend fully on God. So this trust keeps me from being self-confident that I cannot hurt you. This unconditional trust that you're talking about keeps me from over-relying over on you, turning you into an idol or giving you more power over me. Ladies and gentlemen, it is actually very possible to end up turning your spouse into an idol. That you, your, your spouse becomes the very reason for you living. Your spouse becomes the one individual who dictates every single thing in your life to the point that when your spouse hurts you, you feel like it's the end of the world. There, you have turned your spouse into an idol. You've literally made your spouse to be the center of your world, but you're being reminded, no, 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 no. Have unconditional trust in God because that trust will keep you from over-relying on your spouse. Over-relying on your spouse and turning your spouse into an idol, giving your, power, giving your spouse so much power to hurt you, to damage you, to ruin your life, because your spouse is a human being, mere flesh, mere individual. He or she is still growing. And by the fact that they're still growing means that they can let you down. But when you have unconditional trust in God, you're like, you know what? I'm, I'm not over relying on my spouse. I am, I'm not turning my spouse into an idol. I'm putting my full trust in God. This trust also helps me to extend grace to you. When you have unconditional trust in God, you extend grace to your spouse. You extend grace to your spouse because you realize that your spouse, just as you said, your spouse is human. Your spouse is growing. Your spouse is bound to let you down here and there. And, and many times when they don't even want to, you know, it's part of the growth, part of them growing. So Galatians 6 verse 1 and it reads, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path and be careful not to fall into the same temptation. Perhaps that believer being talked about here is your spouse. And you're being told when you have unconditional trust, you're like, I'm going to extend this unconditional trust to my spouse in terms of grace because, hey, you, you can you, you you can let me down. You can fall. You can have instances whereby you don't actually come correct. And because of that, there is grace. This unconditional trust helps me to extend grace to myself. Because normally we like to think of grace, extending grace to spouse, but also we will need grace. Grace to ourselves. Because it hurts. The truth is when you love your spouse, it will hurt you when you hurt your spouse. When you disappoint your spouse, it will hurt you. When you see your spouse going to bed, perhaps offended, perhaps disappointed, it's going to break your heart. And you will need this unconditional trust in God to extend grace to yourself. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins, including your spouse's sins and also your own sins. This unconditional trust makes us appreciate, makes me appreciate that God is working on you in as much as he is working on me. 
there's unconditional trust. Yes, I trust you, my love. But at the, I, I, above all else, I trust that God is working in you and working in me. And because of this unconditional uh, trust, I know I trust in God. I trust in God that you and I, God is working in us. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, in me, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Remember, you're looking at the two various forms of trust. We've looked at conditional trust, which is pegged on effort, what it is that your spouse does, and you're now looking at unconditional trust, which is pegged on grace, where you're depending on God. This unconditional trust also keeps us from blowing up issues to the point that they overwhelm us. When you have unconditional trust in your marriage, whereby you're like, okay, so this has happened. So you have hurt me. So I have hurt you. But we're not going to blow it out of proportion because, hey, in as much as I, I, I have conditional trust in you, we have unconditional trust in God. And it's going to keep us from blowing issues out of proportion. This unconditional trust also keeps our eyes fixed on Jesus. Yes, you have fallen short. Yes, I have fallen short, but we are fixing our eyes on Jesus. We are fixing our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it reads, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. This unconditional trust also keeps us from relying on our human effort, which can quickly lead to disappointment, impatience, or over-expectation. When you're relying constantly, solely relying on human effort, you're bound to be frustrated. I am doing this. How come my spouse is not doing that? I am doing this. I'm so disappointed. I was, I was expecting this by this particular time, and you failed me. You've let me down. So because of that, when you have, when you only have conditional trust, you're going. To, it's going to lead you to disappointment and over expectation and impatience. But when you have yes, unconditional trust, but also at the same time, uh, conditional trust, and at the same time, unconditional trust. What you're going to do is like you're going to rely on. You know, you're going to rely on God. You're like, okay, okay, God is working on you. God is working on you. Unconditional trust also leads to peace that surpasses human understanding. It's not so much about you, it's about God. So we've looked at those two different forms of trust. Conditional trust pegged on effort and unconditional trust pegged on grace. Now, a few truths about trust. A few truths about trust. The first truth is that trust can be strengthened or weakened. Trust can either be strengthened or weakened. You're either strengthening trust or your weakening trust in your marriage. Number two, the first trust, the one that we saw, the conditional trust, it is not given in a vacuum. So you want your, tr your, your spouse to trust you. Your spouse will not trust you in a vacuum. Your, your spouse will trust you based on the effort, based on the activities, based on the stuff that you say and the stuff that you do. So the first trust, the conditional trust is pegged on effort. It is not given in a vacuum. But then the third, the, the second trust, the point number three, the second trust, the unconditional trust that you've seen is given based on both your relationship with God. Based on both your relationship with God, you're giving each other that because of your relationship with God. You realize that, okay, for us, we are not just a married couple. We're a married couple who believe in God. And for, for that reason, we shall trust in God unconditionally, that God will work on our marriage. God will work on you and God will work on me in this marriage. And so we are, it, it, that one is not, it's not based on, 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 on effort. It's based on our relationship with God, which is why it is such a joy when you are somebody who believes in God and your partner also believes in God and you're both a man and a woman chasing after God. Will you fall? Will you have uh, low days? Will you have disappointments? Yes, but at the end of the day, you know, remember you have that unconditional trust. Number four, the first trust, the one that you saw, the conditional trust, it takes time to cultivate. That one takes time to cultivate. Remember that's the one that's pegged on effort. That one takes time because it is based on what you do, what you say. So it takes time. It takes time. It takes time to cultivate it, to nurture it. It takes time to cultivate it and nurture it. It doesn't just happen. You have to be deliberate. You have to be intentional. You have to cause it to happen. You have to do things that nurture it, that fuel it, that bring about that level of trust. So the first trust, the conditional trust pegged on effort, you have to do the work. You have to do the time. You have to make work on it. But then the fifth one, the fifth point, the second trust, the unconditional trust that you've just seen, the unconditional trust, this is based on a, de a decision. You choose, you choose. I have chosen 
I have chosen to surrender, to submit to God. You and I have chosen to surrender and to submit to God, to cover each other, to cover each other. We surrender and we submit. We surrender and we submit. It is a decision. The same way we say that I do at the altar, the same way we say that I do to each other, we are constantly saying I do to God. I do to God. God, we submit to you. As a husband and wife, we submit to you. We submit to you. The second trust, the unconditional trust, it's a decision. It's a, Remember, this is purely on grace, not your effort, purely on grace. We submit to another, one another. And Ephesians 5 verse 21 reads, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit one another out of ref, uh, reverence for Christ. And I love this scripture, especially because whenever the conversation about submission tends to happen, people normally focus the one on wives submit to your husbands. But then we tend to forget this one where we're being reminded that, yes, even as there are other, other verses there, submit to one another, meaning you're humbling yourself as husband and wife. You're bringing yourself and you're telling God, God, we trust you in our marriage. God, we trust you. We are not going to depend on us. Some may trust in chariots. Some may trust in horses, but we will trust in the name of our Lord. Some trust in each other. Some trust in the effort. Some trust that, oh, because uh, I come from this particular family, because of X, Y, Z, because I'm this kind of man, because I'm this kind of woman, I, I, I cannot let my spouse down. No, 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 no. God, we trust in you. We trust in you. It is not us, not by power, not by might, but by your spirit, O oh Lord. So we are submitting ourselves to you. So those are a few truths about trust. Now, I want us to just have a, have a look at this short uh, a clip of an interview that I was having with a couple and just see the exercise that I, I got them to do. Well, <laughs> I know you're wondering what's up with our couples. Well, during the break, we put a blindfold on Christine and Walter and we also tied their legs. So now I'm going to ask, if Christine and Walter can stand up and go to the direction that uh, I had suggested. Christine and Walter, please don't fall. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, and one, two, three, action. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what's, go what's going on? You know, we are tied yeah, together. You're tied yeah. together. Yes. And are you trying to go different directions? Yes. yes. Ah, yes. wonderful, wonderful. You may sit down, you may sit down as you remove your blindfolds. <laughs> you may remove. Oh my. Uh. <laughs> now, as you can see, the demonstration over here was the question is, are you two drifting further apart or are you two coming closer together? Are you two submitting to one another as, a, 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 as unto the Lord or are you two allowing your own human effort and your egos and your, oh, this is who I am, this is how I do it, to pull apart? So are you pulling together or are you pulling apart? Which one? Are, which, which couple are you? Which couple are you? Have you submitted to one another out of reverence for God, or how are you doing your marriage? Uh, something to ponder upon. Now we are going to look at how one can weaken their uh, the, 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 the first trust, the conditional trust in their marriage. We are going to look at specific because we are now going to be very practical. Things that people are doing that are messing up the conditional trust that we've talked about. The one that is pegged on effort. So we're going to look at some of the things that perhaps you are doing or you have done, or perhaps you might end up doing in future, which is why we're here so that we can be able to see things before they happen. So one way of weakening trust is withholding information. When you withhold information, you're with your partner, but you're not sharing what you're doing. You're not sharing what's going on. You're not sharing information. So you're withholding information. You're having secrets. You're having secrets. You're having secret bank accounts. You're having secret uh, decisions. You're having secret projects. You're having secret, uh, just, you, there's a lot of secrecy about you. So that withholding, intentionally withholding information can weaken, win, we can trust in your marriage. Also issuing threats. Perhaps when things get difficult, you tell your spouse, you, if you dare do that again, you will see, you will see who I am. Or because you're the one who's uh, uh, bought the house, who's paid for the house, who is perhaps paying rent, you order your spouse, get out of my house when things get difficult. When things get difficult, you kick out your spouse, you issue threats. You know what? I'm going to with, with, withdraw that. Eh? You will stop driving my car. Eh? Who do you think you are? You cannot uh, talk to me like that and then you're driving my car. Who do you think you are? I will teach you a lesson. So when you do like that, you are weakening trust. Lying is another way that people are weakening trust in their marriage. 
when you twist the story, when you lie and your spouse can tell you're lying or your spouse finds out that you're lying, then these are some of the things that people are doing that is weakening trust in their marriage. Failing to honor one's word. When you make false promises, sometimes some people in the heat of the moment, just to make their spouse feel good, they tell their spouse what their spouse wants to hear. And so your spouse holds on to what it is that you've said, but actually you don't mean it. You don't mean it. You tell your spouse, oh, I, I promise you, by this particular time, I will do X, Y, Z. I promise you, my love, by this particular thing, I'm going to do this. And then that time comes, nothing. You don't say a word about it. You don't, do, you don't fulfill what it is that you said. So there you're weakening trust. You're no longer as reliable. Remember what you, the verse that you've, that you've just read. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. Number five, hanging around the wrong crowd. When your spouse starts to feel like, oh, I, I, I am not so comfortable with the crowd that you hang around with. They, they, they are a bit of a bad influence. So now your spouse starts to question, to wonder, mm, I, um, you know, bad company corrupts good morals. I'm, I'm not so, when in, anytime you tell me you're going to meet so and so and so, I get a bit uncomfortable. I get a bit edgy. So you're making your spouse be at, uh, uh, not at ease, on the edge because of the kind of people that you're hanging around with. So that can weaken we trust. Infidelity. Infidelity is also another way that trust can be weak, uh, can be weakened. And now, when, whenever we talk about infidelity, people normally just focus on the sexual. But there are so many ways that you can end up becoming unfaithful to your spouse. For example, emotionally, where you are intentionally making another person feel special who is not your spouse. You're telling them, hi, love. You're telling them, hey, beautiful. You're checking up on them. You're being their emotional confidant. You are turning in uh, turning to them you are going to their shoulder to lean on their shoulder that is emotional infidelity you know instead of giving your spouse special things you're giving them out to somebody else financial infidelity this is whereby you take your you take your money and then you start to give it to somebody else you're financing somebody else you're financing somebody else's lifestyle somebody else is depending on you and your spouse has got no idea you're channeling funds somewhere else and your spouse has got no idea. You're weakening trust. Spiritual infidelity. This is where you depend on another so much spiritually, especially somebody of, of the opposite gender. They become your prayer partner. You're bonding more. You're, 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 you're giggling and laughing and you're just having this babusadi conversation and literally you're just bonding more and more spiritually to the point that your spouse is becoming jealous. You're supposed to become jealous. You don't pray with me, but I see you pray with that individual. You don't talk to me about God's word, but I see you enjoying and celebrating and cheering, talking to that person. So your spouse starts to feel jealous. Physical infidelity, that's why your spouse notices, I see you in public hugging people in, a, in an inappropriate way. I see you holding somebody's hand. I see you perhaps being touchy with so-and-so-and-so. And so. What is going on? What is going on? You're weakening trust. And then the sexual infidelity, where you may, you may be having sexual intercourse or making out or kissing or fondling. You're just doing sexual things with another individual. You're weakening trust. Another way that people are actually weakening trust is lack of accountability. You don't say where you're going. You don't say what you're doing. You don't want to be accountable. You don't want your spouse to know what is going on in your life. There's no accountability. Your spouse, if your spouse was to say what you do, she doesn't know. He doesn't know. If your spouse was to ask, okay, what, what, where, where do you go? I don't even know. I have no idea what my spouse does. Lack of accountability can weaken trust. Number eight, overprotectiveness of the phone. Every time your spouse gets close to you, you're very guarded with the phone. You have to turn the screen the other way. You have to answer the calls far away from your spouse. Your phone is always on silent. You're, you're, you're very fishy. You, 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 when your spouse is in bed with you, the moment your spouse wakes up, you quickly you know, push the phone to the other side. What is happening inside that phone of yours? Remember, there's a time we saw we're supposed to be smart with our smartphone. So overprotectiveness of the phone. Bad financial choices. When your spouse feels like, I can't trust you with our financial resources. I can't trust you with our family money. You, you, you do some, choice, some, some decisions that... Woof, that made me question, I'm, 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 I'm not feeling financially secure with you. Like, what are you doing? Why, what, what are you do? Why are you making these choices? What are you doing exactly, you know? So you're causing the trust to be weakened. 
inappropriate closeness with an ex. Your spouse gets uncomfortable about how close you are with an ex. Maybe this ex is perhaps somebody that you have a child with. And instead of you co-parenting, you're talking with this uh, person in a very, very intimate way. Or you, 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 your spouse finds out that, okay, you're having coffee with your ex, you're bonding with your ex, you're talking for some uh, quite some time with your ex. So your spouse gets uncomfortable. So that can we can, we can trust. Sudden lack of sexual connection that is prolonged. Your spouse starts to wonder, how come these days you don't touch me? How come these days you don't do anything to me? You don't, you don't desire me. I'm in front of you. I'm naked. We're sleeping on the same bed. It's been three months now. Are you seeing somebody else? So your spouse starts to question. That can weaken trust. Coldness to your spouse, and yet you're over-friendly to other people. So to your spouse, you're cold. To your spouse, there's no thank you. There's no courtesy. There are no kind words. But to outsiders, oh, my goodness. You are a darling. You are so good. You are so courteous. You are so loving. You are so godly. People are seeing Jesus in you outside over there, but your spouse doesn't. Your spouse doesn't see the God in you. And is it truly the God in you? Because why is the God in you selective? Why is the God in you not taking care of your spouse? Why is the God in you only focusing on people outside there who don't really know you for real? Is that really the God in you? Or are you just being selective in what it is that you're doing? Are you being manipulative in your goodness and your kindness? Because if, you're, if you have a kind heart, kindness will be universal. If you have a loving heart, lo being loving will be universal. So coldness to your spouse can make your spouse start to wonder, I don't trust you. I don't feel safe around you. Another thing that can weaken trust in your marriage is judging or insulting or changing in how you treat your spouse after he or she confesses something that was very, 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 very intimate and deep to them or because of their past. You've learned something about their past. Maybe perhaps your spouse confessed, hey, you know, uh, when I was younger, I was abused. Or hey, you know, I started perhaps uh, masturbating when I was in campus, when I was, when I was in high school. Hey, you know, I did X, Y, Z. When I, was, when I was in campus, I aborted or I impregnated a woman and then I told her to abort. When X, Y, Z happened, I did that. So your spouse confesses to you in a moment of vulnerability. And then after that confession, you have changed. So your spouse no longer trusts you. Your spouse no longer feels safe. Your spouse perhaps in future will struggle to open up to you. And so you see, there's so many ways that we can mess up our spouse, the trust in our marriage. There's so many ways we can break trust. Unfortunately, we tend to only think about sexual, sexual, sexual. There's so many ways you can break trust in your relationship. So sometimes trust is a matter of perception. Sometimes trust is a matter of perception. Let us just go back to the story of Joseph and Mary. So Joseph and Mary were a couple. And then Mary... Uh, gets impregnated and then she becomes pregnant. Joseph gets to find out. But you see, when Joseph is like, gets to find out, what's the first thing that comes to, into his mind? Oh, I need, to, I need to let this woman go because I thought she was pure. I thought she was a virgin. I thought you we were doing this, so I'm taking off. Meaning that Joseph was having trust issues with Mary until the angel of the Lord visited him and told him, Joseph, what, what actually is going on? Mary is actually carrying... Uh, the savior, Jesus. So because of that, so already Joseph was perceiving, oh my goodness, there's some trust issues over here. So he was about to act on those trust issues until God in the unconditional trust came and just told Joseph, you know what? There's some work of God happening in Mary and this is what is actually happening. Now imagine if Joseph had succeeded to flee, then Mary would have been like, oh, I thought I was loving Joseph and then he's just left me. And then the trust will have been broken. So we are learning that it sometimes trust is about perception. Some things can be happening in your life that because there's no communication, there's no understanding, now you two end up not trusting in each other. And that's where the unconditional trust of God comes. Because remember, God, God, God sent a message to Mary and sent a message to Joseph. And because of that message, now both of them are able to work together, continue working together as a couple. So for the two of you, if you have that unconditional trust, where you allow God to speak to the both of you, whereby if and if perhaps you've perceived, 
oh, I perceive my spouse has hurt me because of this. I perceive my spouse has hurt me because of that. Then God in the unconditional trust can bring you two together and solve whatever matters that there may be. So sometimes trust is a matter of perception. You could, you, maybe you're not doing anything wrong, but because of what is actually happening, your spouse perceives that you're doing something wrong. Your spouse perceives something is off, which is why we need to constantly be aware when I'm saying this, when I'm doing this, what is my spouse perceiving? When I come home late, even though I'm, do, I'm not doing anything fishy, when I come home late, but I don't communicate to my spouse, what is my spouse perceiving? When I'm being very guarded about an individual, even, even though there's nothing fishy happened between me and them, what does, that, what, what does my spouse perceive when it comes to that? When I'm making decisions for the family, even though they are good decisions, I'm buying land, I'm doing this, I'm perhaps opening up this bank account, I'm doing all this kind of stuff, even though I'm doing a good thing, but I'm not involving my spouse, what is my spouse perceiving? So perception is very important. Do things that your spouse is going to perceive trust, because sometimes we're not doing anything wrong, but the way we are doing it creates a perception that makes your spouse start to trust you less. Remember, we talked about being accountable. We've talked about sharing information. We talked about these things like, what are you doing to be able to build up trust? Because remember, trust doesn't, conditional trust doesn't happen in a vacuum. You create it. You intentionally nurture it. You intentionally do things that communicate to your spouse. You can trust me. I am reliable. And we are covered by the unconditional trust that we have in God. So how to build trust? We're going to go to how to build trust, and then we're going to go to how to rebuild trust in case it's been broken. So how do you build trust? You know you want to be trustworthy. You want trust to reign in your marriage. So how do you go about it? Listen to your spouse's cries. Whenever your spouse is crying about something, whenever your spouse is lamenting about something, whenever your spouse brings to your attention, hey, I am hurt here. Hey, I don't feel good over here. Hey, I yearn for this. Hey, I long for this. Listen to that. Listen to that. The more you listen to your spouse, the more you build trust. Also, number two, make your spouse feel emotionally safe. We cannot separate conditional trust with emotional safety. The more your spouse feels emotionally safe with you, meaning that when your spouse opens up, you listen, you don't judge. When your spouse is talking to you, you're there, you're present, you're thoughtful, you're considerate. The words you use are kind. The tone you use is warm. Even during disagreements, there's a way you handle your spouse respectfully that we can disagree, but I'm still going to handle you well. So make your spouse feel emotionally safe. That way you're building trust. And then willingly give information. Willingly give it. Darling, this is what I'm thinking of doing. Darling, I'll be coming home at this particular time. Darling, I'm spending, um, you know, we're going for a trip with, by, with so and so and so. Uh, uh, darling, today I went, I, 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 I had an investment meeting and I'm thinking of uh, this and this and this. What are your thoughts? So willingly give information. Willingly give information. Don't let it be that your spouse has to fish out for this information. Don't let it be that your spouse is also finding things out from other people or stumbling them on your phone, stumbling upon them on a document in the house, stumbling upon them, oh my goodness, I do not know you're doing this. So willingly give information. Don't have this habit whereby I'm an adult. I don't, I don't need to report to anybody. You're not reporting to anyone. You are building and nurturing trust. It is the wise thing to do because when trust is in the home, your marriage will be sweeter, sleep will be better, communication will be deeper. Number four, be thoughtful about your spouse's needs. Be thoughtful, be thoughtful. Whatever it is that your spouse needs, package your love for your spouse. If something is important to your spouse, be like, okay, if it's important to you, then I'm going to serve you like that. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to bless you like that. You know, even before, before our, our, our session today, I, where, when we were just uh, talking with Zawadi about how the session is going to go, there's something that we talked about how, you know, it's like when you go to a restaurant, when you go to a restaurant, the servant, the one who's serving you, the waiter or the waitress, they give you what you want. You don't go to a restaurant and then you say, for example, what you want is a burger. And then they insist, no, you don't want a burger. What actually you want is rice. No. When, I, when somebody goes to a restaurant and they tell the, 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 the person serving them, oh, kindly give me, you know, burger. Kindly give me a pizza. Kindly give me X, Y, Z. 
you are given what it is that you've asked for. So in the same context in relationship, in marriage, you serve your spouse what your spouse wants. Does something mean a lot to your spouse? Give it. Uh, is, does music mean a lot to your spouse? Give your spouse that. I'll support you in that. Does perhaps uh, 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 just a hug mean a lot to your spouse? Okay, I will hug you. Oh, uh, taking a walk is important to you. It may not be my thing, but I'll take I'll take a walk with you. Um, okay. Um, so uh, perhaps watching a movie is 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 very is very good to you. Okay. I may not like watching movies. No, it may not be my thing, but so that I can show you that hey, I care about you and I'm thoughtful. I will do that with you. I will do that with you. Um, okay, so going for a worship concert is very, very important to you. I have other ways of worshiping, but okay, so because going to a worship concert is important to you, I'll go with you. We shall go there, we shall worship God together, and I shall package my love for you. Philippians 2 verse 3 reads, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves. Value others above yourself. So be thoughtful towards your spouse's needs. Number five, communicate. Communicate. Perhaps you're not you're not feeling that well, and that's the reason why you're not able to make love. Communicate to your spouse by the way, babe. Eh? It's not that I don't find you sexy or there's any particular thing going on. You know what? I'm just, I'm just, I'm just mourning. Perhaps uh, I, I'm just thinking about my late dad. You know, I'm just, I'm just not feeling that great. Uh, this and this is happening. Um, uh, perhaps if, if you made a promise and then you're not able to uh, fulfill it, just communicate. Hey, babe, eh, babe eh, darling, I, I know I say that by June, I'll be doing X, Y, Z. I wasn't able to. Uh, kindly forgive me, but I can be able to do that in August. You communicate. So that way you're building trust. Involve your spouse. Involve your spouse. When you're making decisions, hey, uh, darling, I'm thinking of X, Y, Z. What are your thoughts? Uh, what, what input do you have? Do you think it's a good idea? That way, you're building trust. Number seven, spend quality time together. Remember, just as we saw, one of the ways that uh, you can weaken trust is when there's no connection. So but how do you build trust? Create a connection. Have quality time, not just time, quality time. Quality time means that when you're together, you two are bonding. You're not on the phone. You're not uh, ignoring your spouse. You're not just there physically, but not there emotionally. No, you're there emotionally. You're bonding. You're laughing. You're intentionally creating time, regardless of how busy your day has been. Do, are you working very hard? Perhaps you're working two jobs. Awesome. You're working very hard for your family. You're working eight to five. You're working perhaps night shifts. I don't know what it is that you're doing, but create that quality time so that your spouse knows that you intentionally create, even if it's 30 minutes, you're creating 30 minutes for us. And in so doing, you're helping me to trust you. Maintain boundaries that demonstrate faithfulness. It's great to be social. It's wonderful to have friends. By the way, have friends because there's more to life than marriage. Have friends. But as you have friends, maintain boundaries. Laugh with your friends, but not flirt with your friends. Don't call them, hey, uh, sweetheart, dear, darling, babe, sexy, beautiful. No, those, are, those belong to your spouse. Those belong to your spouse. So have boundaries, maintain them, maintain them so that your spouse can feel, are you faithful? When, when, you, when you're outside in public, be faithful. Online, on social media, be faithful. When you're talking to people, be faithful. Affirm your spouse also. There is joy in affirming your spouse. When you tell your spouse, I love you. When you tell your spouse, you are amazing. When you tell your spouse, I love you. When you tell your spouse, you're special. I treasure you. You are building and reinforcing trust. And then also avoid acting suspicious. Avoid acting suspicious. As you've seen, trust is also a perception. Let your, your spouse perceive what is right. Don't do things that, you know, they're right to you, but to your spouse, your spouse might perceive something different. Just, for example, as, as you've seen, you know, it's okay to be chatting with your phone. It's okay to be on your phone. It's okay, perhaps, maybe what you're doing, you're doing, you're doing some work. Maybe you're operating a business on your phone. But don't be suspicious with your phone to the point that anytime your spouse comes, you, you're hiding it. You're turning the screen off. Your spouse is wondering, okay, what is going on? Don't be that person who... Every single time you're coming home late, you don't even say where you're, where you're at. You don't even tell your spouse how your day has been. Your spouse is like, okay, what exactly are you doing? You're giving a ride, perhaps in your car, you're giving a ride to somebody of the opposite gender and your spouse is not even uh, aware. Instead of just letting your spouse, oh, by the way, today, today I met up with Brenda. Oh yeah, she was telling me, blah, blah, blah. I, was, I just gave a ride from point A to point B and she said a big hello to you. You know, that way you are not being suspicious. You're not being suspicious. But now when you start keeping things and hiding things and behaving funny, you're not going to build trust. 
as you can clearly see on this particular phone, this is a lady who's being very cheeky with her phone, being very cheeky with her phone. Now, this kind of behavior in marriage doesn't help to foster trust. It doesn't help to foster trust at all. So if perhaps if you've been very guarded, maybe the way you've been operating, it seems like you're married to your phone more than to your spouse. You're more protective of your phone than of your marriage. Then perhaps it's time for you to consider and be like, okay, uh, this phone that I have, these things that I'm doing in this phone, are they even that important that I'm willing to make my spouse doubt me for them? And then you realize that no, no, no. Even the people that you're chatting with, the people that we, we chat with, some of them we chat with them for like two, three months or even uh, for like a year, and then they disappear out of our lives. But your spouse is there for life. So ask yourself, these things that I'm doing on my phone, if, my, if, there's, if, if, if I will not be happy if my, father, my spouse finds them, so am I doing them? Why am I doing them? Are they worth it? Are they worth ruining the emotional well-being of the one that I sleep with, the one that I'm raising children with, the one that I'm investing with, the one that I'm building a future with? Is it really worth it? The answer, no. So how to rebuild broken trust? So maybe perhaps you've seen some of the stuff that ways that people can actually break trust and maybe you're there, you've already broken trust. So how do you rebuild broken trust? Apologize, apologize, yeah, apologize. Take full responsibility. I am sorry I hurt you. I'm sorry I let you down. I am sorry, please forgive me, please forgive me. Please forgive me, I hurt you, I let you down. Take full, full responsibility. Don't start blaming your spouse. You know what, I did that because you did this. Oh, I talked to you like that because you talked to me like this. Oh, I did this because I was revenge. No, take full responsibility. For what I did, I am sorry. For how I spoke to you, I am sorry. For perhaps how I entertained another person, I am sorry. For keeping things from you, I am sorry. For not being accountable, I am sorry. I am sorry. Number two, don't justify your wrong through many explanations. Ah, you know it's because of this. Oh, you know it's because of that. Oh, it's no. Some, some of us, especially as believers, we love blaming the devil. Ah, it is the devil. It is the devil who led me to do it. No, 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 no. It is not the devil. Just take responsibility and be like, I messed up. Whether you messed up willingly or you messed up, uh, perhaps it was just it, it just, it just happened. Take responsibility. Take responsibility. Number three, go out of your way to share information without being asked. Share information. You know, if you want to, re if you want to rebuild trust, you've already broken it. Now that you're rebuilding trust, you share. Even if your spouse is not going to be receptive, even if your spouse is going to, you send you send your spouse uh, perhaps a screenshot or you let your spouse know, okay, this is what it is that I'm doing. Or you let your spouse know, oh, I've just finished paying for, for X, Y, Z. Perhaps I'm, I'm clearing up a loan, the loan, the mess that I got, got, got us in, or perhaps I did X, Y, Z. You know, you share that information without being asked so that now you demonstrate to your spouse, hey, I'm working on this. I'm working on this. Hey, look, that person that 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 person that that that, that uh, uh, was being an issue to us, I've blocked them. And just so you can see, uh, just so you know, that's it. I'm I'm done. We we we've I've closed that chapter. Next, block or cut off the habit or the person who caused you to break the trust. Did you perhaps break your spouse's trust because you entertained another individual or because you, uh, you 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 fooled around or because of a habit? Maybe the habit is drinking, or the habit is betting or the habit, habit is gambling, or the habit is perhaps uh, masturbating that your spouse feels like, oh my goodness, you know, do you really love me? Why are you touching yourself and I'm here next to you naked? Just let your spouse know, okay, okay, I am cutting off this habit. I am blocking this individual. I am stopping this ways. From now on, if it's if it's if you want to uh, win off your drinking, because maybe perhaps uh, for you you're feeling like, okay, I may not stop drinking entirely, but perhaps I will phase it off. Then okay, I will, I will tell your spouse this is what I intend to do. This is what I intend to do. So that way you're building trust. You're building trust. You you're, you're rebuilding what it is that you've broken. Number number five, ask your spouse. This is a very important point. Ask your spouse. How can I win back your trust? I acknowledge that I've broken your trust. I acknowledge that you don't trust me. I acknowledge that right now, whenever I leave the door, you're not, you're not, you're, you're not comfortable with me. I acknowledge that right now, every single time I just touch my phone like this, you are feeling uncomfortable. So tell me, my wife, tell me, my husband, how can I win back your trust? This way, you're packaging your solution for your spouse. So ask your spouse, how can I win back your trust? I really want you to trust me again. I, I accept it. I've messed up. I accept it. I accept it. I've let you down. I accept it. You're struggling to trust me. So tell me, how can I win back your trust? Help me. Help me, my love. Number six, 
allow your spouse to ask you questions to bring about closure. If your spouse wants to ask you questions, like for example, uh, what led you to that? You know, why did you why did you entertain that person? Am I not beautiful? Am I not good enough? And then you, you just reply, you just answer. Don't brush it off. Don't be like, ah, how many times have we been talking about this? Ah, what I, I thought I'm I, I thought I'm saying, I said I'm sorry. Why do you keep bringing this thing up? Allow your spouse to ask the questions. Okay. Why do why why did you not involve me in this in, in this deal? Hey. Uh, I didn't involve you because I was scared of, of this. I was I was pressed to the wall. It was a bad situation. So if your spouse has got questions to ask, let your spouse ask the questions. It helps your spouse to gain closure. Number seven, be patient. You're rebuilding trust. And rebuilding takes time. It takes time. It takes time, you know. Uh, so perhaps your spouse may not believe that you're serious. Perhaps your spouse may not believe that, okay, whatever it is that you're doing, I don't, I don't buy it. But still be patient. Be patient. It will take a while. It will take a while. It's, it, breaking trust can happen in like an instant, but rebuilding it takes time. So be patient. Number eight, slowly bring down the walls of your spouse through consistency. So consistently do it. You know, Be consistent in, how, in, your, in your pursuit, in your effort. Remember, we're talking about the conditional trust, which is pegged on effort. Be consistent. Don't do good things day one, day two, day three. And then from there on, you're like, ah, I give up. For how many times? I'm done. No, you're the one who broke the trust. So be consistent in bringing back the trust. Number nine, start new conversations. Form new memories. You know, it, 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 whatever it is that has happened, yes, it's happened. But start to form new conversations. Uh, maybe perhaps you start to have a, a new laughter. You watch a new movie. You start telling your, your spouse, oh, by the way, eh, I, I, today I, I remember there's this movie that we went to watch five years ago. That was so funny. Do you want to watch it again? Try and start new conversations. Try and start new conversations so that you're not constantly just saying, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for hurting you. I'm sorry for hurting you. Start new conversations and form new memories. Number 10, get right with God. Get right with God. Work on getting right with God. Remember, unconditional trust in God means that God is working on you. And as God is working on you, God will also work on your spouse. So your spouse may not forgive you, may not look like he or she is forgiving you immediately. But guess what? Get right with God. In you getting right with God, in you transforming and changing your ways, in you just being like, God, I trust you, continue to work on me. Yes, God, I messed up. Yes, God, I let my spouse down. Yes, God, I spoke to my spouse in a certain way. Yes, God, the way I judged my spouse, my spouse no longer trust me. Yes, God, the way I operated, my spouse no longer trust me. But I'm going to get right with God. And as I do so, God, please, please work on me and work also on my spouse. And then lastly, what to do when your spouse breaks your trust. So we've looked at what to do when you've broken your, your spouse's trust. So now, what about when your spouse has broken your trust? Now you are the one who's been offended. What do you do? Number one, see the humanity and fallen nature of your spouse. Remember, we've seen that your spouse is human. Your spouse is human. And sometimes your spouse will let you down because number one, they are flawed. Number two, out of fear, they can make a decision out of fear. Number three, out of bad influence. Number four, they can just have a bad day. Uh, number, number five, they may not be aware of what it is that they're doing and it is wrong. Number six, you know, it, it, it just could be that or they, they ended up reacting to perhaps what it is that they thought you were doing. So there's so many ways that can end up leading to your spouse breaking your trust. So see the humanity and the fallen nature of your spouse that, hey, my spouse is human. Also see the humanity and fallen nature of you. Why is this important? Sometimes we focus so much on my spouse has let me down. We don't also realize that we are also capable of letting our spouse down or even we have let our spouse down in other ways. So you are human, your spouse is human. You both have let each other down or can let each other down. So see the humanity and fallen nature of you. Number three, communicate to your spouse your disappointment. My love, you've disappointed me. You've disappointed me. And, and, and that, that, that doesn't sit right with me. So communicate, communicate. Because sometimes we don't communicate these things. We're just hurt. We're just heartbroken. We're just giving our spouse silent treatment. We are not even talking with our spouse. We're just being cold and giving our spouse an attitude. So communicate to your spouse your disappointment. Number four, present your spouse to God. Present your spouse to God. God, my spouse has hurt me. And remember, I'm banking now on unconditional trust. Unconditional trust is that I'm trusting that the God who said a good work in my spouse, a good work in me, will be faithful to complete it. So God, I release my spouse to you. I represent my spouse to God. God, you, you, you know my man. You know my woman. 
when we got married, this was a man, a woman after God's own heart. You know, I don't know what has happened to him. I don't know what has happened to her. I present my spouse to you, O oh Lord. Number five, appreciate your spouse's effort, especially if he or she demonstrates remorse and effort. So in case your spouse is demonstrating remorse and effort, you can clearly see your spouse is putting in the effort. Please appreciate that. Appreciate that. Appreciate what your spouse is doing and the change in behavior. Number six, rely more on unconditional trust in God working in your spouse. Rely on that. Like, I trust I trust that the God who, who loves us, the God who's still working on my spouse, the same way the God is working on me, is also going to work on my spouse. Number seven, see it as an opportunity to strengthen your love. You know, many times uh, brokenness and, and this situation that we go through in marriage are an opportunity to deepen and strengthen love. For many couples, they can tell you that they knew that they were loved when their spouse had reasons to stop loving them, but then still chose to love them. When the spouse was like, oh my goodness, uh, I know what you did was not right, but I'm still going to love you. I know the way you said it wasn't right, but I'm still going to love you. I remember yesterday I was having a conversation with a gentleman and we were talking about some of the deepest vows that you've ever, ever had. And he was sharing about this vow that he had of a gentleman who was telling uh, the, the, the spouse, I will love you even especially when it is hard to love you, especially when it is hard to love you. So see it as an opportunity to strengthen your love. Number eight, focus ahead, focus ahead. You cannot change what has happened. You cannot, you cannot put back spilled water back into the jar. It has already poured. Whatever has happened, whatever happened last week, last year, five years ago, it has already happened. But what you can do is you can repair and your spouse needs you to repair. As your spouse is putting in the effort to rebuild trust, your spouse needs you to help to rebuild it. So Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19, and it reads, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. So perhaps God is saying, I am doing a new thing in your marriage. I'm doing a new thing in your family. But unfortunately, you're stuck in the past. God is telling you, I'm doing something new. Don't you perceive it? I'm doing something new in your home, in your love. Don't you perceive it? So don't be so stuck in the past. Focus ahead. Yes, your spouse has hurt you. Your spouse said sorry. Your spouse is broken. But hey, can we rebuild it? Can we build, can we build again? Number nine, ask God to help you to forgive. I know sometimes forgiving is difficult. I know sometimes forgiving is not an easy thing, especially the one, just as we, we saw earlier when we were starting, you know, the high, this is the highest level of bond in a human being. So you have this expectation of him and then they've hurt you. And then, they, and then he, she has hurt you. So ask God, God, help me to forgive my spouse. Honestly, help me to forgive my spouse. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Mark chapter nine, verse 24. Ask God, God, I know you're doing something new in my life. I know you're doing something new in our marriage. Help me, help my unbelief, help me. And then number 10, be fully responsible for your peace. Remember what it is that you say, your spouse is not fully responsible for your peace and your emotions and your well-being. That is 100% your responsibility. Don't be a reactionary slave to your spouse that right now you can't even sleep, right now you're suicidal, right now you feel like a loser, like right now you feel wasted, right now you feel like you're the scum of the earth simply because your spouse has let you down. No, be responsible for your emotions. Be responsible for your peace. Be responsible for your well-being. Be responsible for your emotions. That is your personal responsibility. Be a good steward of yourself. Your spouse is only human. Your spouse is not your God. So when you do like that, this is going to keep you grounded when trust is shaken. When you're going to realize, okay, okay, I'm spending the, I'm spending a house with somebody who I thought would never do this to me, but they've done this to me. But does that change me? Does that make me, do I now start to feel like, oh my goodness, I'm a loser? No, no. I, we've had some X amount of years that were good and then you've done this, it hurts, but I'm still, I, I'm still going to retain me. As we work on this particular thing, I'm going to work on my, I'm going to keep my peace and I'm going to keep my emotions. And then lastly, number 11, store up grace in your marriage. Store up grace in your marriage. Your spouse may need it now and you may need it to, tomorrow. Maybe today, it is your spouse who needs grace. It is your spouse who needs forgiveness. It is your spouse who needs to be covered. And you never know. 
Maybe two years from now, you're the one who's going to need grace. Maybe two months from now, you're the one who's going to need to be covered. Maybe three months from now, you're the one who's going to, re, to, to rebuild trust. Remember we've said, again, I insist, infidelity or sexual uh, cheating is not the only way to break trust. You can break trust in your relationship, in your marriage in so many ways. And so maybe today it is your spouse who needs that grace. Save up grace because maybe tomorrow you might need it. Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse eight, and it reads, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. The grace of God is sufficient. The grace of God is sufficient. Has trust been broken in your marriage? The grace of God is sufficient. The grace of God abounds. It is possible to repair. It is possible to rebuild. It will not be easy. It will take a while, but it is worth it. It is worth it. You too have come so far to give up now. You've come so far blessed. God has shown so many testimonies in your relationship, so many testimonies in your marriage, so far for you to let it go down the drain, so far for you two to adjust to a new normal where you're not talking to each other, where there is uh, bitterness and there are, there, there are wars between you two. No, if you've broken the trust in your marriage, put in the effort, the conditional trust, and build it. And if perhaps you're the one who's been the victim, who's been offended, it is perhaps, perhaps time for you to extend that grace. And perhaps you two are in a good place and you're wondering, okay, yes, we trust each other. How can we make our trust even better? Today we've learned. Today we've learned how you can build trust. But above all this, even as you've looked at conditional trust, which is pegged on effort, I beseech you, also embrace unconditional trust in your marriage. Unconditional trust where you're not depending on your strength, but depending on God. When you're not depending on your will, but depending on God to hold your marriage together. And God's grace that surpasses all, all, all understanding. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. May it govern your marriage. So thank you very much for tuning in. We have been looking at building and rebuilding trust. Tomorrow we are going to look at how we can be better parents at the same time, better spouses. Better parents and better spouses because Many people are complaining that, hey, my spouse is a good parent, but not such a good spouse. Help, what do we need to do? And then day three, we're going to look at what men complain about sex, what women complain about sex. And yes, it has been a wonderful joy to uh, lead you through. So I, are there any questions so that we can take them up? Any questions so that we can take them up? Um, any questions and then we can get to tackle them. And get to tackle them very very important so any questions feel free feel free to write in your questions and then we can address them uh somebody is writing talking of perception my partner has totally refused to be accountable over whereabouts to be able to build up trust this was our idea in the first place and i agreed to it we stay long distance and only visit weekends i can never tell whether she's at work out shopping back to uh to the house in the evening that information is never willingly given, while on my side, I share it as an, as an obligation to her. She only shares it on the need to know basis. On weekends is when you learn of her weekly activities. There is change in behavior, and recently I bumped into her makeup kit that I didn't even know uh, she does. My spouse, ever since we met for over three years, now is not a makeup person. Her clothes are suddenly being uh, resized to, um, uh, to short and tight. Uh, what are your thoughts? Should I be worried? Any conversation to raise my concerns normally ends in days of silence and none answers. How do I initiate such a conversation and get my concerns addressed? Very, very important question. And I, I can totally uh, empathize with you, especially that, now that you say that it's also a long distance marriage because it is important, especially uh, willingly sharing information. It is very, very, very important um, uh, especially long distance relationship where you can get to build up that trust since you're not even coming to the same home every single day. So perhaps uh, the best way of actually doing it, you know, one of the formulas that I, I usually give when it comes to addressing matters is, first of all, start with appreciation. Start with appreciation. You know what, my wife, thank you. 
Thank you for the X amount of years that we've been together. It's uh, like, really, really, you've been such a blessing. I've grown so much with you. I love you and I cherish you and, and, and then all. And then you just start to ask, you know, what, what are the areas that you feel like, what, what, what do you love so much about our marriage? And then she starts to say, oh, I love this. I love that we've got X amount of children. I love that we do this. I love that we, we can laugh, we can talk. Okay, okay, awesome. And then now you answer. Uh, I personally, I love X, Y, Z about us. And then you ask the next question. Are there any areas you'd like us to improve in our marriage? And then she can say, okay, maybe we can improve with X, Y, Z. And then you can be like, okay, uh, me, I think like we can improve on, on this particular, on uh, perhaps I can feel like we can improve in terms of sharing information. Uh, like I, I want to be sharing more information with you. And I'd love it if you share with information with me so that at least we can, uh, uh, we can I, I just want to feel like I'm a part of your life. Don't say it as if like, I don't trust what you're doing. Say it as, you know what, uh, it, it feels good when I'm a part of your life. It builds a bond, especially that, now that you're far away from each other. Uh, what do you think about that? And then she can share her thoughts. So that way you don't make her feel like she's going on the defensive. Because many times when you correct our spouse and we get them to the defensive, if we don't we don't get the solution that we want. So just, just, just uh, something to consider if you want to... Um, uh, to talk further about it, please feel free to reach out. Uh, another question, can your husband call someone bestie? Can your husband call someone bestie? I can understand, you know, this is a very, uh, very, very, very thin line, you know, bestie, because bestie now implies, especially I, I think you're asking husband calling another woman bestie. So you start to wonder, bestie means what? Is that lady your best friend? Like you share stuff with you. So perhaps just ask, maybe it's, it's, it's good to ask a uh, husband, hey, but hey, when you call that lady bestie, what exactly do you mean? And then maybe says like, oh, you know, it's we, we, we know each other from way back. It's been years that we've been together. And then you just ask him, okay, uh, you know, when you call her bestie, it doesn't feel right. I appreciate that you, that you, you know, you, you two have known each other from way back, but can you just find another way of calling her like instead of instead of that because it makes me feel uncomfortable so maybe it's just the approach that you can consider when you talk with him i can understand why that may not sit right with you and we're here we're talking about perception uh now there's a question there's another question over here uh what if your partner is not willing to build a trust and an uh, and unapologetic what can we do in the case that your spouse is not willing to be apologetic, in case they're not even they're not even willing to build trust, and it can get there. Remember, you don't have 100% control of your spouse. You only have 100% control of you, which is why we kept on saying, you know what? Uh, don't, you have 100% over your emotions, over your well-being, over your peace. So in this particular situation, you, you, you just, okay, you ask yourself, okay, have I chosen to stay in this marriage? Well and good, I've chosen to stay in this marriage. Then to, if I've chosen to stay in this marriage, then I need to just focus on what I have 100% control of. Uh, let's focus on what is that we have in common. We focus on, the, on, on that particular thing. And perhaps it is good to start to interrogate where did your spouse start to drift apart? What exactly happened between you two in your marriage? Uh, what, what, what transpired between you two? If your spouse perhaps uh, has been complaining about something, perhaps it is worth considering, okay, let me perhaps consider applying some of the complaints uh, that my spouse has been asking about, whatever is within your control. But if you realize that, okay, I've just been, I'm, I'm just with a hardened individual because sometimes your spouse can just be hardened. Your spouse can just choose to have a hardened heart. If your spouse has chosen, chosen to have a hardened heart, you focus on what works for the family, if it's raising the children, if it's working on the investments and stuff like that, you focus on that, you find out on the common ground, you also approach it from a place of appreciation, like I appreciate this and this and about you, but also maybe perhaps one day you can consider, okay, by the way, uh, my husband, would you like us to even try counseling, to even try counseling? It's not because you are the problem, not because you, I don't trust you, but so we can improve and nurture our marriage. Because sometimes, and I've seen this play out many, many times in counseling, whereby somebody comes thinking, ah, all is well in our marriage. And then when they start to open up, they start to talk. And then even them, they thought that if all was well in their marriage, they have a lot to talk about. And before you know it, they are forming a lot of ground. So it's just something to consider, something to consider. But above all, remember, you have 100% control. 100% control over, over, over what it is that you, uh, how it is that you feel and your peace of mind. How do you break the wall and rebuild trust when there is silent treatment, when there's silent treatment? Very, very good question. Very, very, uh, very, very good question. So whenever the silent treatment, the silent treatment perhaps happened because of something. What brought about the silent treatment? Maybe they hurt you and then you hurt them or you two perceive that you've hurt each other. So perhaps consider if 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 there's been a it's been if there's been a 
if you feel like, hey, my spouse has communicated that I've hurt them in a particular way, then maybe you can consider, okay, I'm just going to apologize. Even if I'm not going to get a, 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 like a, an apology back or I forgive you, I'm just going to say, first of all, I'm sorry. I'm going to send you that on a text message or even when you're together on the bed, my, my husband, my wife, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for the way I spoke to you. Please forgive me if there's any way that I've actually hurt you. You can consider that. And then now the next thing that we can get to do is, you know, uh, just ask them questions. Uh, is there anything you'd like to eat? Uh, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. Anything that you'd like me to get from you? Uh, or, hey, mom, say, mom told me to say hello to you. Dad told me to say hello to you. Uh, you know, this kind of stuff that that now, at, at least you, you're trying to give information that's going to now open up the person, open up the person. And number three, you can just, uh, there's power in appreciation. There's power in appreciation. Just find a way to even just tell the person who's very silent, like, hey, I know you and then you're not in the mood for talking with me, but I just want you to know something. Thank you for the person that you've been in my life. Thank you for, you know, today I was just going through some of our photos and we've come from far and I appreciate you. I treasure you. I really, really do. And I don't like it when you're mad at each other. I really look forward to the day we're going to get to talk again. That's number three. Uh, number four, sometimes just give them stories. Just as you've seen, willingly share information. Just give them stories. You can, uh, you, they're, there, they're not talking, but you're like, okay, you know, today I saw so and so and so. This is how my day has been. Da, 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 da. And then you're just talking like that. And then maybe as you do like that, progressively, a time is going to come where they'll be like, okay, by the way, I, 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 something you told me two weeks ago, uh, I agree. I agree with that. And you don't also give silent treatment. When you're being given silent treatment, try not to also give silent treatment because that way there'll be a cold in the home and then it's going to be prolonged. And mostly silent treatment, usually people go to silent treatment. It's not, it's not healthy. It's not fair. But usually people go to silent treatment when they feel like they're not being hurt when they feel like they've been hurt, when they feel like, okay, we're not understanding each other, or when they feel like, okay, I'm being judged. So look what exactly is going on in your marriage. What if my spouse keeps on breaking the trust over and over and over again? Maybe it is worth to consider asking your spouse, okay, this thing that you do, how do you feel when you do it? And then they'll be like, okay, I, do, I feel like, that. and then uh, do you want to stop it? And then they say, okay, if you want to stop it, okay. Because I can imagine when they say, uh, what, I, I, imagine, I can imagine what it is that you mean. Like that they give you the, the promise that they're going to change, but then they don't, they, a few weeks or a few months later, they fall or they do the same thing. So ask them, okay, if you want to stop this, how do you think you can stop this? And how, what, what, it, what is it that I do you think I can do for you to stop it? So you ask them these questions. But remember this, you can only provide a conducive environment for your spouse to change. You cannot force change. You just pro 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 produce a conducive environment. So in the event that you're trying all these things and then your spouse is still hardened, just know that you can only pick your battles. You're like, okay, I am trying this, I'm trying this, I'm trying this, I'm trying this, okay. Uh, I, 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 I've, I've tried to forgive you. I've tried to extend grace. Uh, you, keep, you keep disappointing me. You keep letting me down. You know what? I will perhaps... In as much as I'm going to give you unconditional trust, when it comes to conditional trust, I am going to be very careful when it comes to you. When you tell me this, I'm not going to hold it into full, uh, like dear to my heart. So I'm going to just um, be, be, be strategic in my approach with you, even as I give you unconditional trust. But another thing that you can get to do, uh, sometimes when something like this happens, consider going for therapy on your own. Consider going for therapy on your own because sometimes when you when you go for therapy and I've seen again I've seen this play out in many many times when you're giving a lot of information like the the, the background you see for example like over here we don't have context when you're giving context in a therapy session and then now uh, the counselor might be able to realize ah uh, might be able to work with you on all. Oh, Think this could be happening because of that and that and that. So perhaps that's something to be happy because sometimes it's great that you go for therapy with your partner, but sometimes if your partner is not willing to go for therapy, you can just go for therapy on your own. Another person is asking after an, after an argument, the silence creates space for other temptations to come in. I agree with you. I agree with you. Silent treatment is not healthy. It's not a good way of doing it. And I agree with you. It can create temptations. But I want to beseech us to remember this, that, you know, temptations come and go. But sometimes when you do uh, entertain those temptations and then we do bite them and then we do enjoy them, and then you realize that whatever the silent treatment was on about, now the temptation have even complicated the thing even further. So in as much as temptations will be there, let's try and exercise control, self-discipline and foresight, vision, and just think like, okay, even if I fall into temptation right now, what is the end result? This temptation, okay, so like, let's say if I entertain another person, 
I can't marry that other person. That other person will not be in my life. I cannot even enjoy them. So what is the use? What is the use? So the temptation will be there. And just as we started by saying, it will be there. The temptations will be there. But it's just knowing that, okay, is it really a long-term solution? Is it really a long-term solution? So I want to beseech us that, you know, you can, maybe perhaps in another way you can find, we, we, can, we can discuss on how to break down the walls in your marriage. Uh, what do you do when communication is a problem? No accountability, no joint decisions and consultations. It is frustrating. Sometimes it is good to reflect back and ask yourself, has it always been like this? Has it always been like this? And most likely it wasn't always like this. Most likely most couples, they start when things are good, there's good communication. So it's always good to look back and ask yourself, what happened? What exactly happened? Did we drop the ball somewhere? Did my spouse tell me something and I, I, I handle it differently? Did, did, my, did, did I handle my spouse differently? Did, did my spouse handle me differently? What exactly happened? What, what led to that? So ask yourself, number one, that one, number one. And then number two, ask yourself if there's been any judgment, insults, uh, uh, a tension between, between the matter. If not, then ask yourself, is it a cultural thing? I appreciate that sometimes some men just have a negative view towards women and some women just have a neg negative view towards men. And this can, can, can cause a barrier in terms of communication. If it is that, then you realize that, oof, I'm fighting actually a cultural problem. If it's a cultural problem, then you're able to, it's perhaps that it's, it's a moment for you to consider showing your spouse that, hey, my gender is not your enemy. I'm a woman and I'm not your enemy. I'm a man and I'm not your enemy. Like I'm there for you and I'll show you kindness. I'll show you that you can trust me. And when you show your spouse that I'll be faithful with little, with little information, then slowly your spouse can start to share with you more information. And then also sometimes some people are not so, it's not natural for them to communicate stuff. So sometimes we teach our spouse and you teach our spouse by sometimes telling them, okay, sharing this information, showing them, okay, on my side, I'm going to share this with you. And then they start to feel, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for telling me. Thank you for telling me. And then you sometimes also you have to ask, you ask the right question, but you don't ask not in an interrogative manner. You ask, but hey, uh, I, 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 saw, I, I saw that you applied for, for so and so and so. How is that going along? And so I saying, yeah, it's, uh, I was thinking I'm actually going to study uh, uh, outside of the country. Oh, okay, okay. Well, how, when, when, are you, when are you willing to go? Uh, so you don't ask, you don't cut feelings. You don't jump into conclusions or you become hot tempered or you become angry. How come you never told me this? You ask questions, leading questions in a not interrogative way, but in a manner that can encourage your spouse to open up and, and, and show that. Because I, I appreciate that you're frustrated, but sometimes the way we handle it can either decide whether the spouse will keep on, uh, keep things from us or willingly share stuff with us. My partner is not willing to go for counseling as a couple with the information I've gotten from your ministry. I feel I need therapy for myself because I'm 100% in control of my peace and actions because it really has affected uh, me totally. Do you offer online therapy counseling? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Kindly reach out. Kindly reach out. Kindly reach out. Uh, the number will be, uh, the, the, my, my number is uh, plus 254-721-590954. That's plus 254-721-590954. Plus 254-721-590954. We can get to have a conversation and get to see how we can get to do the therapy. Much appreciated. Thank you so much for that. Uh, another person is asking, uh, oh, there's, there's a link, there's a link that has been shared on WhatsApp uh, to join the WhatsApp group. We have a WhatsApp group. If you're not a member of the WhatsApp group, kindly uh, click on the link and you shall join the WhatsApp group where we can get to share more information and share the links, to the videos, and also the PDF formats of, of the talks. Another person is asking, how do I handle a situation where my husband carries decisions and other information with his family and not me, the wife? Uh, you just uh, there, you just hear things when they have happened. You just hear when things that have happened. I know that can be very, very hurtful. And especially family. You know, sometimes our biggest competitor is our spouses, parents, and siblings, where our spouses perhaps, because the years, you know, parents and siblings, your spouse has spent years bonding with them. They're so close to them. And some people, they struggle to adjust to marriage. You know, even when the Bible is telling us a man shall leave his father and mother and join his wife and the two shall become one. Some people struggle to leave. So if that's the situation, uh, the way you handle it, 
uh, is very, very important. So I want to beseech you, please don't handle it in a manner that, okay, why do you do this? I hate it when you do this. Uh, you, you, you can just be like, oh, okay. So for example, if you hear something that from from, from outside as you go like, oh, okay, okay. Oh, by the way, I was told by your brother that uh, you, uh, you you just bought a piece of land, for example. And then, yeah, 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 I'm thinking of buying a piece of land. Oh, wow, wow. Uh, when did you actually get to do this? I, I did that in March. Oh, oh, by the way, how okay. How come, you, how come you didn't tell me? It will, it will actually be very good. I would have loved just to go and uh, see it together with you. And then, oh, no, don't worry, don't worry. I'll, I'll go there with you next time. I'm like, awesome, awesome. I, I really love it. I've loved that you've had this conversation uh, and that you've had me and that it's actually gone, gone very, very well. I'd love it if we can do uh, more stuff together because perhaps the challenge is not so much that he's sharing information with the family members, that, but that he's not sharing it with you. So the way you approach it, don't show, don't show your partner that okay, uh, um, you he, uh, the family, the family is your enemy. Just show your partner that hey, I would love if you just involve me. And sometimes, one of the things in marriage, don't go for uh, absolute solutions. Absolute solutions are like you want something done now this way. Sometimes you just walk th walk things through to the direction that you want them, which will require patience and direction. So perhaps it may start with your spouse having a conversation with you about the matter, and then it may start with your spouse now perhaps sharing with you today, not sharing with you tomorrow, that's progress. And then it continues to your spouse now sharing more and more with you, and then your spouse sharing with you and also with the family members. And then you progressively go after a few uh, weeks or months, you find out, oh, now your spouse is now sharing more with you and less with the family. But that might take a while. So think long term. Think long term. Very, very important. Think long term. Uh, another person is asking, uh, hi, Dan, do you take insurance cover? No, I do not take insurance cover. Uh, thank you so much for that question. Thank you so much for that question. Um, and then there's also there's a link to our our website, hgimlove.com, a link to the website. Another person is actually writing, oh, my goodness, you have helped me. My wife and I were just... We're just grateful because we needed to learn more about trust after I messed up. This has been a game changer. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Appreciated that. Appreciated that. Another person is uh, writing and saying, God bless the ministry. I was, uh, I was told about this by a friend and I do not regret coming. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Another person is writing and saying, let me just read this one. Um, oh my goodness, where have I been? Uh, I, which hole have I been in? I do not know about these seminars. I will be joining. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for thank you so much so much for that. Uh, and then lastly, we have another person saying, "You have no idea how much God has used you to heal our marriage. We were close to divorce, and now we are. Wait a minute. Oh, now." Now we're thinking about reconciliation. Now we're thinking about reconciliation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And truly, truly, truly to God be all the glory. To God be all the glory. Uh, so yes, so thank you very much. Thank you very much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for staying in. For those ones who stayed in from start to finish. Um, there's another person who's asking, okay, I've already answered that question. Uh, so very, very important for us to keep on investing in our marriage or our future marriage. Tomorrow we shall be looking at how to be both great spouses and great parents. Same time, same time. And then the next day three, we shall be looking at what men complain about sex and what women complain about sex as you look at marriage holistically. So shall we pray? And even as we pray, we're going to pray for our host, gift Zawadi loves that thou uh, God can fully heal her and make her whole when it comes to uh, she, she, uh, her, her voice so that now she can get to fully recover her voice. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your loving kindness. Thank you so much for just teaching us about trust. And thank you, Father, for, for, for covering us and for showing us, Lord Jesus Christ, on how to go about uh, building trust and also rebuilding trust, oh Lord. Father, for those ones who've uh, messed up trust, oh Lord, we pray that, Lord, we shall give them the wisdom, the grace, the intentionality to be able to restore. And we thank you, Father, for the testimonies and the feedback that we have received. For those ones whose trust has been broken, O oh Lord, their unique situation, you know their unique challenge and situation, O oh Lord. We just pray that, Lord, we shall guide them to a place of healing and to a place of repair, Lord. We ask, Father, for reconciliation in our homes. We pray, Father, for reconciliation in our marriages. We pray, Father, for the softening of our hearts, Lord Jesus Christ, that indeed, O oh Lord, we shall be able to reign and have your way. 
We want to pray for gifts that we love, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for uh, the host that she is. Thank you, Father, for the person that she is and for the vision that you've planted inside of her. We want to pray, Father, for her and that Lord Jesus Christ may be able to restore her voice to full function and be able to just allow her to enjoy um, uh, enjoy the grace, Lord Jesus Christ, that you've showered her with, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father, for the input and the impact that she has in terms of blessing lives. We give, you, we give you glory and honor. We want to pray also for the HGIM team, Lord Jesus Christ, and every single individual who participates in making this possible. Thank you for every single individual who's joined today and who will join tomorrow and who will join in day three. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' name, we are pretty trusting and believing. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. Thank you all so much. Kindly join the WhatsApp group. The link is on the chat section. And see you tomorrow, same time, wherever it is that you're tuning in from. God loves you. God bless you. Thank you.